Hi, Taz, are you ready to start? Yeah, ready. Thanks. Hello, hello everyone. Um, my name's John Fordham. I'm from the uh, Yorkshire and Humber Academic Health Science Network. Uh, I just want to thank you for joining us today uh, to talk about Docabode's uh, workforce management platform uh, and how it can kind of help with the current situation. We've got a few different presenters today um, to kind of share their different stories uh, and aspects of what we're what we're going to be talking about. Um, but I just want to start off just with a little bit of housekeeping, uh, just to help things running smoothly, um, so that we can kind of get through nice and uh, nice and easily. Um, in terms of questions for today's session, I could I ask that you use the chat um, option on the right hand side of the screen? If you've not already seen it, um, if you're going to hover towards the middle of your screen, there's a uh, kind of blue uh, chat icon, and if you chat with all, any questions on there. Uh, we can kind of work through at the end of the session. We'll also keep a record of any questions we can't cover today as well. Um, all I ask is just so you kind of try and keep the question quite short because uh, the box is only so big um, and it'll help us kind of uh, get some quick, quick answers as we go through as well. So everyone should be automatically muted, but if you're not, please can you keep yourself muted as well um, during the session as well, just so we can keep everything smooth and running as, as we go through. Um, so as I say, we've got a number of different speakers today. Um, very kind of kind of grateful for joining us um, and kind of sharing their sharing their stories. But I'd like to start um, by introducing Dame Barbara Haken, uh, former Deputy Chief Ex uh, Executive of NHS England, um, to talk about the kind of the, her experience with Zocabo. Uh, Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, I I just wanted to start by to be honest by saying I can only imagine how difficult it is for you out there at the moment um, and to kind of reiterate my thanks on behalf of everybody who's ever had anything to do with the NHS and its patients uh, for, for everything that you're doing um, and hopefully uh, in the next hour um, we'll be able to talk about something which will help you. Um, the NHS faces many challenges uh, and may face many challenges before we had uh, coronavirus and the workforce is obviously a particular one, particularly the primary care workforce. And in addition, I think all of us looking at the challenges facing the NHS probably knew that digital solutions were going to be, uh, uh, be a big part of the way in which we address the problems we were facing. So what you're going to hear about today is a digital product that uh, actually uh, helps with uh, workforce issues, Dock Abode. Um, it's already in use in the NHS, and I think that's you know, really important at a time like this, because I completely recognise that at a time like this, people haven't got time for trying out things that aren't, uh, aren't already uh, fully tested. Um, so it's already being used, particularly in the out-of-hours space, uh, to help people with uh, their workforce issues. Um, my view, and, and those of, of many, I'm sure, is that in this particular and current crisis, we are going to have an even greater workforce crisis in the community because there are going to be many more patients cared for in the community who would normally have uh, have been in hospital. And many of those patients, uh, you know, will will need the care of, of a, a group of community and primary care physicians uh, and, and all the widest clinical staff um, who themselves are depleted because of the virus. So as I say, Docabode's already tried and tested and ready to scale. And hopefully um, some of you will find that this helps you out in, in the circumstances. Bob, um, over to you. And my guess is that the, um, the, the centre is doing quite a lot to look at um, oven ready innovations that it can get out to people quickly to help with um, with the dreadful things that are going on absolutely i think less show oven ready and much more actually just ready to go um this at this key time of crisis digital innovation's got a major point role to play and products just as like docker bows absolutely fit the need both in terms of being able to communicate immediately to get resources but also i've got a longer term contribution around actually the gp workforce crisis so and we're doing all we can to accelerate this
John, would you like to um, introduce uh, the Digital North and what, what the purpose of these were originally? Hi, Vicky. Thanks for that. I think I've, I've fell in the trap of being muted myself whilst starting talking. Is the uh, it's the uh, the common common mistake. Um, so yeah, so I was just um, saying thanks for that, Bob. I think the um, it's worth just giving me a bit of context just to explain kind of how how we all end up um, on this WebEx today because um, it's part of a Digital North piece of work that the four uh, Northern HSNs um, have been coordinating throughout the last year or so to work with companies um, that are kind of based in our regions, our kind of best of breed and seeing how we can kind of promote them across the kind of whole of the north of England um, to see how we can kind of help um, you know, help help promote these kind of really good uh, solutions out there which um, you know should be should be adopted orally so as I said it's the four um, HSNs across the north um, if you could just pop to the next slide Taz um, so essentially, from you know, from an HSN's point of view, um, it's all about promoting, uh, encouraging spread and adoption um, of you know, innovations across across our relative areas. Really, um, so in terms of kind of working with companies like Dockerbode, um, it's kind of what we normally do, um, but it's something about how we're trying to work together as HSNs in the north to kind of amplify that effect um, and move move things forward. And obviously, obviously. So when these sessions were originally planned, um, you know, the the, uh, the the country's kind of changed, facing some new challenges at the moment. Um, before we uh, before we started kind of planning these sessions, really, so um, we're kind of adapting really the content in terms of what we're going to do uh, to see how we can kind of help and um, you know, hopefully um, provide some benefits and solutions in this in this kind of difficult time. Um, but I was just going to pass over to Taz uh, to sorry to Phil. Um, uh, where are we? Yes, we are. Dr. Phil Jennings, uh, Medical Director and uh, Deputy CEO of the Innovations, Innovation Agency Northwest Coast, uh, who can talk about uh, a bit more about the work they've been doing with Dockerbode. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much. So, um, importantly, as well as being the Medical Director at the Innovation Agency, I'm also a GP by background. And in fact, the majority of my clinical practice now is in and out of our setting. So, this is an innovation that's pretty close to my heart. I've been working with Taz and the team for a number of months now, and I was immediately able to see the benefit of Dockerbode right from the very, very start. Um, if you can just move on to the next slide for me. So one of the things um, that's changed in response to the COVID crisis is that AHSNs are now profiling their work. And we're probably going to focus about 70% of our efforts towards dealing with COVID, so quite different to how things were previously. But there are a number of initiatives, including Dockerboat, that were pre-existing, which immediately answer the COVID crisis, as you can see. So I think the first point to make is what Barbara's already alluded to. So at the moment, the majority of primary care has moved on to a telephone triage model. We're seeing very few patients actually come up to the surgery. This is a point in time, and I think what we need to acknowledge is that over the coming weeks and months, there will be a need for assessment of patients in their own homes. Now, that will be a population of COVID patients, but also it's the other people who are at home, so it's the shielded population, or indeed other patients at home with long-term conditions that will need their usual care. And that's going to create a challenge for us in primary care because we're just as much um, disturbed in terms of our staff, staff and workforce sickness rates as everybody else. So increasingly we'll need to work collaboratively in order to meet this need and Dockerbo provides us with an immediate solution to be able to do that. So I think it's really important that we try and anticipate this change in our clinical activity and try and implement things like Dockerbo now so that when that need arises the systems and processes are ready to go. As, you, as I said, um, in our previous work's been in the out-of-hours setting uh, where I work. Again, out-of-hours are challenged services at the best of times in terms of workforce. And whilst me and everybody else is doing our best we can in hours, at half past six at night, that becomes a real challenge. And, and certainly over the last weeks, we've been overwhelmed with calls to the service, um, dealing with, with uh, COVID, um, COVID responses. I think there's an opportunity to recruit a new workforce into the out of hours. There's many clinicians who don't want to sign up for a full shift, but actually 
and especially at the moment, want to do their part to help with COVID and through a platform like Dockerbode can dip in and out and often it's they can recognise it's a patient who they know through this platform and they're the very best person to be able to deal with that. So again, there's a, a, an enormous potential to bring in an untapped hidden workforce and that's going to be crucial uh, to fighting this COVID, this COVID issue. Also in hours, um, as we mentioned, we're going to need some further coordination. So again, I can see how Dockerbode would be uh, a perfect solution for PCNs or other groupings of practices working together so that we can coordinate the activities of both GPs and other clinical staff uh, much more effectively across the geography. And you'll see there's even very, even new innovative things. So things like PPE or maybe even some other work that we're going to need to do around um, certification of death. Again, maybe things that we didn't think of uh, initially with Dockerbo, but how we're even evolving now in response to the crisis. So the final point I'd like to make is that Dockerbode comes ready-made or oven baked, as you said. You can see already that four Northern AHSNs are backing this product, NHS England, NHS Digital, NHS X, they're all behind it. It's been through the work to make sure that the IG, the other governance and clinical standards are there. So we can provide reassurance to providers that, that your patients are safe, your staff are safe, and you're using a platform uh, that's already had that background early work done so you can be confident it's the right choice. And if I could just have the next slide. And so uh, thankfully in response to the COVID crisis the guys at Dockerbode are now um, offering this great offer out to the system so that they'll be able to uh, waive their first six months of license fees and in fact there's just a small implementation cost which is really just to cover costs. So it is a, it's a great opportunity Again, the AHSNs are there in the background to help with some project and programme management support if necessary. So um, I can't speak highly enough of Dockerbode. It's one of the best products that we've seen. Uh, and I hope um, very much that uh, through the course of the rest of this presentation, you'll see just what an opportunity it uh, presents. And so I'll hand over to Taz. Thank you, Phil, for the kind words. And thanks for everyone for joining us. Um, being a GP myself uh, and practicing, um, it's very stressful out there. Um, I created Dockerboard um, years ago now, just trying to, to really help us to, to work around our lives, our flexibility, but to be able to support the NHS. And, and Dockerboard is, is solely for NHS providers um, uh, who offer services to NHS patients. So hopefully over the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I'm just gonna tell you a bit more about Dockerboard. Um, and please do, if you have any questions, just put them in, in the chat. So what problem are we trying to solve in this current crisis and even before? Um, Phil has uh, very concisely uh, talked about the workforce challenges. Um, we're going through self-isolation, we're going through illness, there are lots of safety fears. Um, how do we uh, use the workforce in an agile, in a right way? And to, to match uh, skill sets and our qualifications and our interests um, with the demand that we're seeing at the moment. We talked about the current demand over the last week or two being everything digital and te uh, telephone by default first. Um, what we um, are anticipating, and it's something that has been uh, published by NHS England now, uh, is that we're anticipating a huge surge in home visiting. Um, and like Phil mentioned, the 1.5 million patients that we need to shield as well as all the non-COVID related matters that we were struggling with anyway in urgent care. The logistics side of it, this is a really key part of Dockerbode, which allows organizations to work collaboratively around the pool of clinicians and to be able to deploy them safely using your EPR um, and matching them with the skill set is, is going to be critical. The clinician safety we've talked about, we know there are a lot of fears around PPE. Hopefully we've uh, mitigated some of that with uh, some changes we've made to our platform. Um, and the patient safety concern is around a lot of people that um, are at home who are unable to really access the face-to-face -face services that they need um, due to everything that's going on. So this was just um, 
to show just the, 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 the six urgent priorities that were published by NHS England and NHS Improvement last Thursday. Um, Nikki put out a letter to all GPs and all commissioners um, and the prominent area that we were obviously uh, interested in was this significant increase in home visiting due to the reasons we see around social distancing and the isolation. I'm going to now show you a short animation just to give you a, a, an idea of what Dr. Bird is. When a patient's health need becomes urgent out of hours, they call NHS 111. If they require a home visit, the GP out of hours service dispatches a clinician. But these services normally cover a wide region and urgent care activity has now risen to an unsustainable level. Annually, there are over 800,000 out of hours home visits in England. Limited resources cause persistent delays, allowing patients' symptoms to deteriorate, or worse. That's where Docker Bode comes in. It is a powerful mobile platform which allows healthcare professionals to set their availability to undertake out-of-hours home visits, connecting patients with faster, bespoke healthcare. The visit request comes in, which is matched with clinicians based on their availability, proximity and expertise meaning clinicians are in total control, accepting jobs only when it suits them. A notification prompts them to respond. Once accepted, they can easily access all the vital information needed to conduct the visit. If rejected, the request is simply passed on to the next suitable clinician. With Doc Abode, patients receive speedier home visits attended by the most suitable local clinicians, leading the way towards a sustainable NHS workforce. Be part of something bigger. Sign up now and start delivering urgent care on demand. That was actually our recruitment um, animation when we launched this live uh, in the NHS in Leeds uh, back in 2017. It was our recruitment drive to, to really get clinicians to, to sign up to this. I'll start with what Docker Build isn't. Um, we're not a local company um, and it's not patient facing. This is for healthcare providers to deliver and safely connect patients with a multidisciplinary clinical workforce out in their homes based on their availability and their proximity and their expertise. And this really, just, like Phil mentioned, it widens a flexible, sustainable and resilient local workforce and gives providers um, the ability to manage complex real-time logistics in a very dynamic way um, by creating a very more responsive healthcare system. And for us as clinicians, um, we set um, our uh, preferences and, and we are informed of whether patients are our own registered patients, whether it's a language match uh, and other matching criteria. When we talk to clinicians about why they didn't want to sign up to the shifts in the urgent care system, there were many, many reasons. Some felt de-skilled in certain areas. You can select certain things, whether it's respiratory or whatever it may be, and you are then notified and, uh, and matched of them. The next animation, again, is, is something uh, just to show you the journey that we've been on. This isn't a product that's just been developed in the last few weeks. This is back um, showing our whole journey to get to this point. And if you just bear with me, I'll play this. Yorkshire and Humber Academic Health Science Network connects academics, the NHS, researchers and industry to accelerate the process of innovation. We do this by addressing real-world challenges through the adoption and spread of innovative ideas and technologies across the NHS. To Taz Alderwood to combat the pressures of supply and demand in the primary care sector. A GP with years of senior management experience Taz witnessed the struggle of recruiting and retaining out-of-hours clinicians. Recognising the need for urgent care services to be improved, Taz began to develop an innovative platform, harnessing digital technologies to offer an on-demand, flexible clinical workforce. The project received a lot of interest from investors, but Taz felt it was important to retain control of Dockerboard at such an early stage. It was then that he approached the AHSN for guidance and support, who immediately recognised the potential of Dockerboard and its positive impact on patient safety. Taz was successful in his application for the AHSN's Proof of Concept programme. He received funding for development and support from AHSN partners with regulatory compliance, market analysis and commercialisation. AHSN introduced the use of the software simulation tool Netimis and funded pathway modelling and scenario testing to illustrate the benefits of Dockerboard on the urgent care system. 
As a result of this collaboration, Docabode was successful in its application to SBRI Healthcare's 2016 GP of the Future, in turn enabling further development of Docabode with live NHS trials covering a population of over 1 million people. Feedback from the first live trials of Docabode was extremely positive, with GPs impressed at the ease of using the app and patients with the speed at which a doctor arrived. The evaluation of the impact of Docabode is being overseen by Professor Mohammed A. Mohammed, the AHSN's non-executive academic director. This data will also be used to provide health economics and return on investment guidance to Docabode. It is our ultimate plan that the spread of the Docabode innovation will be supported by robust evidence of impact. So this was very early on in our journey, um, but we have moved on and we've deployed across large areas, including the, the whole of West Yorkshire, Blackpool, uh, moving into other areas, including Greater Manchester. Um, so what does it look like? Um, Dockerboard is an app that's on uh, Android and, uh, and iOS on Apple, um, where you can download it now. The providers have a dashboard which um, sits um, with them. And until the provider assures you, they do the assurance, not us, of each clinician. Uh, and obviously in the last couple of weeks, that assurance process has changed just to reflect the, the urgent need of, of having clinicians onboarded. Um, and they are able to push um, visit requests out into the locality um, for those clinicians to, um, to accept. So just a quick overview of how uh, the flow of that. The clinician uh, registers, um, they can go onto our website, and we pass that request through to the provider who signed up to Dockerboard, and they effectively have the assurance button. Once selected, the uh, clinician has sent a secure authentication to then have the credentials to log into the app. Um, and they set their availability, they set their preferences, if they're affiliated to a practice, um, what languages they can consult in, what specialties they want to do or what they don't want to do. Uh, and then effectively the healthcare provider in real time from, from the EPR is able to push out dedicated visit requests. Um, and the clinician sets uh, a, an actual drive time, which is calculated in real time, to say whether it's 10 minutes from the current location, and they then receive notifications if it's within that area. And the, the matching criteria is also obvious on the app as well. And the, effectively, if they decide to without any obligation, they can then pick up that job request and uh, undertake the visit. The model is changing, um, whether they go out and do that themselves, which has been the norm before COVID. Um, Liam, who, might, who is gonna talk later, might tell you a bit more about how things are adapting. Um, and then they update the record in the EPR. Um, when the, the visit request goes out, um, due to IG, there isn't any patient identifiable data until you're in a direct care relationship with that patient and you accept the job, and then the notes get transferred into the app. But to complete it, you need to put that into whatever EPR you're using. And then the clinician gets paid, and that payment per job is set by the provider. So just a bit of a graphics to show you a bit more about what it looks like. The important thing about Docker, though, is it's a place-based, so multiple providers in one area are able to have the dashboard. Uh, and obviously, the patient is in the center of this whether that's a GP practice or a PCN, um, or the wider and larger urgent care and community trust and mental health trust can all be part of this. As the clinician is assured on each organization, that comes up on the same app, and they can set their availability on and off for each organization. And again, this isn't GP specific. It's based on a multidisciplinary workforce, and the provider provides that assurance to that particular clinician. Um, what we've also adapted is um, for, the, for, for now for the COVID situation is to easily differentiate between suspected COVID um, and in non-COVID. Um, some people are calling them hot and cold sites, some red and blue. This is absolutely critical because of some of the issues that are going on right now. Um, it's quite a scary time. Um, and in the community and in primary care, we need to know what we're getting involved in. And through Docabode, um, you can set that so that clinicians who have the right kit or who can be picked up and taken with the right kit, they're able to see and differentiate those that have nothing to do with COVID, um, obviously with the right sort of protection as well. Uh, we've worked hard um, with um, the big EPR um, uh, companies, and this one is Adastra, uh, Advanced. This is the one that's been used by the majority of urgent care providers up and down the country. Um, and there's a, for, for those that are familiar with this, 
is the queue to send out visits, and there's a button there that says send to Docker Build. That then gets taken into the Docker Build platform, and then um, the, the dispatcher in the provider who's in control of that dashboard sends it out to Docker Build, where that information uh, is seen by the Docker Build clinician. Um, this was uh, just to, to show the evidence. Um, I make sure that everything we do has um, an evidence and impact assessment in every area that we deploy in. Um, this was our uh, initial findings in West Yorkshire. Um, the teal, the light blue, is the standard response times, and the dark blue um, is when Docker Build is overlaid on that system. And you can see that it's very responsive, and there's an independent evaluation that we can share about that. But more, more recently, we pulled data from January, um, and we, we just pulled the about 1,400 jobs that have been done, and about a third of them had been that were offered were accepted. And they were accepted very quickly by the Docker Build clinicians, well, under two minutes. And the response time from being uh, from accepting the, the, that, that visit request to being face to face with the patient was less than 14 minutes, which is actually quicker than um, a Category 2999 ambulance. And the acceptance mirrored the availability of jobs. Quick video of uh, Dr. Sultan. She is a GP partner at Garfield and Leeds. And she was actually the first GP back in 2017 to pick up the very first Docker Build uh, job. She signed up um, with the uh, urgent care provider in West Yorkshire called Local Care Direct. And she set her preferences, um, I think, as, as elderly, um, uh, care of the elderly and cardiac. And she wanted to see her own patients. And it was her 86 year old patient with heart failure who was set a, a two hour disposition and was told it was an eight hour delay. Um, it was 13 minutes from Nigat location. She attended, and she called me to say, um, Taz, I hope you don't mind. Um, I've had to show the patient the app, and they love it. Um, and, uh, you know, you're capturing feedback. Um, so we said, actually, at the time, we, can we just get you? And this is her just talking a bit about when she uh, undertook that initial piloting for us. Exciting way of working. What I really loved about it was uh, the convenience, the flexibility, the ability to work from home. And what was even greater was the feedback that I got from the patients. They loved it, the prompt service. And actually, the 10 visits that I did during the trial, I'm sure two of them I avoided an unplanned admission. I'm really excited about Dockerboard. I can see so many potential applications, especially moving forward and looking at the new models of care. One of the important, important points is around this cross-organizational collaboration. So if you have a pool of clinicians out in the field um, that are willing to work, not in a shift, but in this way, um, that Docker Build workforce um, can be working, whether it's for a practice or a PCN or the out of hours. And if you're not a doctor, if you're providing phlebotomy services or palliative care, um, you can set your availability all from one app, as long as that organization has assured you. And that way, across a geography, you're able to take care of the needs of that patient. Obviously, if it's a COVID uh, visit, um, those you're able to flag through Docker platform and through the visit, and whether you have the right protection available. And this just leads me on to talk about the clinician safety and well-being. This is absolutely paramount for us, and um, we have created a new feature around identifying where PPE is available through Docker platform. That could be either a clinician sat on a stockpile. Uh, or in a location that they can go and pick it up from. As we hear, there is more coming on the way, and this is going to be critical, as well as the logistics to managing the service as we move forward. Um, and we need to strike that balance between responding to these cases with and without suspected COVID as these home visits um, are, are going to be surging over the next few weeks. Um, people undertaking visits are, and long shifts are worried about the high viral, viral loads uh, through suspected COVID cases. Obviously, through this way, you're able to select one, two. We have a job stacking feature that allows you to do a certain number, um, but you can keep that limited with the Docker Build way of working. And it's really about empowering clinicians to be able to just accept jobs based on their uh, skill set, experience, and, 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 and own interest. For patients, we recognize that there is um, a very effective way to remotely assess people. Um, and through all the evidence and um, systematic reviews, in normal general primary care cases, that's about two thirds of patients. Typically, a third of those are deemed to need a face to face. We're hoping normally that they can come to a clinic. But I think this is why there is going to be a, a big rise in the home visiting, um, as well as the shielded patients we talked about before. 
Continuity of care is going to be really important in managing patients and then their safety and their confidence. And through Doctor Bode, you are made aware of whether this is your own registered patient, where that's applicable, um, and so you can um, you know, hopefully keep them at home where they're safe. This is just a, a screenshot from uh, with adapted the the ability to send uh, secure PPE PPE collection locations, and you can do that through the platform. And that's seen as a, a separate area to the, again through assured people uh, to know where they can collect that from. And just to say that with uh, the HSN have backed us through the Innovation Exchange Portal. Uh, we've also been approved on the GKT Futures Framework, and hopefully going to hear very shortly about the HSSF Framework to make this as easy as possible. These are evidence-based innovations that these organisations back. I'm going to uh, show you another clip for more recently uh, with Dr. Kapoor. He is a very prominent Dr. Build GP clinician, and he just talks a little bit about um, why he signed up to Dr. Build and some of the benefits. So the main thing that attracted me to Docker Board was the autonomy and the independence it gives you. So it lets you organize your work around your personal life. I think the main benefit is that it prevents burnout. So it, it's it's quite a fresh concept and it keeps you energized and you can do it in your own time. It doesn't feel like you you've taken out a chunk of your weekend for an out of hours. You can fit it around your schedule. I think as a concept, it's transferable to various organizations. Um, health workforce crisis remains in every sector of the NHS. So, you know, why restrictive to GPs? This is applicable to healthcare assistants, to nurses, to pharmacists, um, and cross organizational working, and especially when GP surgeries are being encouraged to work as primary care networks, which are being encouraged to commission services on a footprint of 30 to 50,000 patients. So, it's a very intelligent way of utilizing and tapping on resources that would otherwise not be tapped into. The quality of care remains the same high quality of care that we provide day in and day out throughout the NHS. Just finishing off now, um, we were selected by the Secretary of State for Health at the Expo um, as being a transformative digital innovation in the workforce. Uh, I'm looking like a very excited uh, schoolboy in the corner there, um, and I still can't even to this day remember what I said to him, but we've got uh, a lot of interest there from the centre. And this culminated in us winning the uh, Best Workforce Innovation Award at SBRI. And I put the comment up from the judges who could see how this was so applicable to different parts of the NHS in this way of working. And last slide is just about our implementation. Um, we have now set up and we have the backing um, to scale this very quickly in organizations. Um, lots of things have happened in the last couple of weeks around bring your own device, around some of the IG, uh, around uh, people, uh, well, clinicians having access to the EPR through their own computers which has made things a lot easier. Um, but we still have all the clinical safety conforming to NHS Digital's DCB 129 standards around clinical risk, all the governance, all the data privacy impact assessment, it's all there. We have all the training packs, we can deliver everything remotely, um, and we will try and get every uh, from evaluation and data point of view. Um, this is something that will help during this crisis, but it is also something that we hope will be absolutely relevant beyond this as well. Um, and, and into going live. Just some of the contact details there. Um, and I'm going to pass you over to Liam uh, Mahon, and he's from one of uh, our uh, providers, our customers who have rolled out Dr. Build. So over to you, Liam. Thanks, Taz. Uh, can you just give us a nod if you can hear me? Yeah. Uh, so just briefly introduce myself, uh, uh, Liam Mann, as you can see, I've um, come across to the NHS from policing originally, and uh, we've had a successful implementation of Docker Board in our out of hours services in the filed course in the northwest of the country. Um, a bit of history of our implementation. The initial pilot happened in sort of the northeast area, and it was very successful, but it was from a, a scale model. So five cars all work in the same general geographical area, and it was it was quite effective at being implemented, and they were able to create efficiencies in doing so that reduced them to four cars. Our business model was very different. We have got UTCs in 
very different geographical locations. So we've got Morecambe Bay, we've got File Coast, and we've got Doncaster in the northeast, all of which only run one car at a time over the weekend. So we went into this not in the mind that this was a way to make efficiencies because we knew they were there. We went into this knowing that the current model for out of hours just isn't coping anymore. And to just add another GP car and driver to the shift pattern wasn't financially viable for us. And this seemed like a better way of providing that capacity to help the service cope, which I think is very relevant to the challenges we're now facing in the COVID situation. So we've always looked at Docker Board as a way of dealing with the demand issues, not an efficiency model. Um, the implementation itself it, as was technically really, really good, really interesting, really fun. And I would say they were a great company to work with. We managed to get interoperability with our current system that we provide out of hours through, which is Adastra. Um, that works fairly intuitively. It, the technical side of it isn't a burden on either the clinician or the non-clinical administrators so we use shift managers you may have a different function in your business but the burden isn't that impactive from a technical side just because the interoperability and the system itself are so intuitive i refer to it as it's like iphone level intuition it just it's just really obvious what you need to do when you interact with the software so from a technical point of view we were worried at first because of the staffing, the age groups that were going to be interacting with it, but it, that was never an issue. They all essentially took to that quite well. Um, some of the things that we've brought in technically to help us, we were initially pinned down to um, just those that had access to our trust laptops that were on the network because you, we still decided that we wanted the clinician to view the patient record before they saw it. Um, and to do that, they needed access to our Adastra system. We've overcome that since, and we now use a virtual environment through our provider that we can project onto anyone's own device, which has really opened up the network of GPs that we can link into. Um, in terms of clinical workforce, there was a couple of risks that were raised when we were making our decisions around this. And one of the risks was it, it looks like it might be that good that we might lose our standard business model and we might lose people that do shifts for us might end up just doing a board and they might stop doing our shifts and we may have an impact on the ability to fill those. What we've actually seen is the complete opposite. What we've seen is people that we've um, signed up to now work for the company that didn't work for us before, not only do they pick up Docker board jobs, but they will actually fill out of our shifts for us and shifts in other areas. So the whole sort of holistic view of the service has been improved by Dockerboard, not just merely the visits themselves. From our learning, the initial part of the Dockerboard clinical visit, that's something you need to invest in. You need to, you need to push them out, you need to focus on them, and you need to prioritize them. I wouldn't approach any implementation of this system with a this is an efficiency model straight away and we'll just send out the ones we need. You need to get them out there. You need to get people engaging with it. Clinicians need to see that visits are there so that they engage with it. And from the non-clinician that's managing that system, they need to have the faith that there's someone on the other end of the system that will pick it up. So there's, there's a balance there to be made. So what I would say with any implementation is really, really push at the start and just get people engaged, get them using it, get as much out there as possible so that you've got a workforce that is comfortable, even if they don't pick it up, that they saw that there was a job there and that they're comfortable that actually, if I decided to put a few hours aside for Docker Board today, I'm comfortable that jobs would come through. Um, Docker Board and COVID, that it is now technically our company response to the COVID situation and our staffing problem that this is our digital strategy. We are moving it now from just the out of hours application. We're moving it into in hours because we're being asked to support PCN networks and small husband wife surgeries that when they go, when they're getting ill or the coming into contact with someone having to self isolate, they cannot maintain their in hours visiting and they're asking us to support for us. This is where Dockerboard is going to come into its own. And 
is going to allow us to use resources and share them across PCNs to help each other out. To, and I've always said this about uh, Dockerboard. The thing I like about it is it breaks down the boundaries, the organizational boundaries that stop available clinicians getting to and treating patients in need. All those boundaries go, and it's just about matching most appropriate resource to person in need. And that's what I've always liked about this product. And I think that is why we are prioritizing it as a company, as our response. I won't go on any further around um, the transformation side. I've led that internally, but the question and answer, if you want to touch base with me afterwards, please just send me any questions you've got. I'm quite happy to help you out. We're just on the question and answers now. Uh, hopefully they've been collected, if there are any. Yeah, we've. Um, uh, <clears throat> shall I take those now, Taz? Yes, please, yeah. Okay. Um, we've only got one question that's come um, from Paul Hanmer. Uh, a very good question, actually, which first I'll, I'll direct that at Bob, and then I'll ask Phil to answer it. Uh, so Bob from an NHS England national perspective, and then Phil, uh, hopefully answering uh, not just on behalf of the Northwest uh, Innovation Agency, but on behalf of all the AHSNs. Um, so the question, uh, which you can see there from, from Paul is, um, what help or resources are, are the AHSNs or other bodies able to offer to ensure that primary care is deploying the most effective workflows to maximize the opportunities of innovations such as Dockerboard. So, Bob, over to you. Are you are you still on mute, Bob? You might have lost Bob. Phil, Phil, do you want to pick that up first, and then Bob Bob can come in at, uh, after you? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think. Simply, we're here to, to make it happen. So you may well have been listening to the presentation and thinking there's all kinds of problems here, whether it's funding, uh, whether it's sign off from your CCG or your ICS, uh, whether it's clinical governance issues. Uh, we've done this before already, uh, as you've heard, and so we've got the answers. And so it doesn't really matter from whereabouts in the north you're listening to this presentation or even in fact further afield your ahsn is there to help you get that implemented and we will either uh, talk and liaise with the clinical leaders whether that's centrally or regionally on your behalf uh, and help you with implementation and we've also got a lot of experience already with how this uh, can be rolled out. So all of those things that you're sitting there thinking, but what about scripts? But what about controlled drugs? But what about IG? Been there, done that. And um, you need to just take it from me at this stage, at least, that we can work through all of those problems and we can use our experience to help you to work through them very, very quickly, get it deployed. So really, I think, um, at this stage, if you're interested, speak to your AHSN and speak to Dockerboard and together, I'm confident that we can get this mobilized very, very quickly. So that's what I would ask for, I suppose, at this point from anyone who's listening and wants to take the next step. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Phil. Uh, Bob, I, I can see you're still on the line. Uh, are, you, are you with us? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, but a lot of echo. So basically, we're accelerating access to digital innovations like Docker Boat and a range of other ones. Um, and they should be out shortly. And if you want any information, contact the health system support team. And I'm sorry about the echo. Okay, th th thanks, Bob. Do, do any of the other AHSNs on the uh, on the call, want to add to either Phil or Bob's um, um, response? Okay. Okay. So I, I think a, a very pertinent question is: great presentation. What next? How do we how do we um, get to adopt the system? Taz, I'm I'm going to ask you that question. Yeah, sure. Thanks, John. Um, 
thanks thanks for, for listening really glad you enjoyed it um i think just contact us uh, like phil said um on info at um and we will take the next steps we've had some great support from the hsn network and they will um support us both to make sure we can get this deployed we can do it remotely we've got all the packs and the guides ready to go um so i think just contact us and i will reach out to wherever you may be based uh, and, and speak to the people of the HSNs, and they will be able to help us mobilise this um, quite, you know, quite straightforward. Um, and as Bob says, there are various procurement frameworks and things on, but we can discuss all that, um, uh, and, and just, you know, we'll we'll get this in as soon as we can. Okay, Taz, can you can you also just say um, how this is going in Greater Manchester and how it's uh, been impacted by COVID? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm allowed to say what uh, we've won an award recently in Manchester and that's really accelerated the growth uh, and, and an interest across GM. I think they want to announce that um, separately. But um, we're absolutely, we're working with established out and out provider like Mastercall um, and they are really keen to get this out uh, at pace and at scale. Um, we've got interest in how this working across PCNs and in hours as well. And it's how do we manage all of that together? Uh, we initially, over the last couple of weeks, we saw a dip in the, the home visiting because providers weren't sure what to put out because of all the issues in safety. Um, but I think, and there was a, well, there was supposedly a national home visiting team when they were testing for COVID. All that's changed. So people have really been quite isolated and been quite distant from people who have actually genuinely needed someone to go out and see them. Um, so now they are preparing for a big scale up of the home visiting service. Docabo doesn't replace the existing cars who ha can go out and see the emergencies, who might need more kit and things available. This adds resilience and supplements that. This is additional workforce. It's not just trying to replace everyone, but it is important to know about the way that the that, that shifts work and may be impacted by COVID as well. And we're just keeping an eye on that. And we're very careful and always analysing the data in terms of what happens, so we can explore that together, working with the, the Manchester AHSN and, and colleagues. Okay, thank, thanks, Taz. Uh, a couple of questions of a similar vein. Um, I'm going to Liam. I'm going to ask ask you to pick up the uh, the first part of it because it's asking about timescales for implementation, and I know you've got a very specific experience of of what it takes to implement. But could you could you uh, look forward and say if you were to minimise the implementation that you did, how quick could you put Docabode in um, introduced in, in, into primary care? And I know you're looking at primary care as well. Um, realistically, I we did it in eight weeks, start to finish. And that was including the DCB0160 work, everything all in. Uh, that was relatively new to us. Um, I, if you designed it properly and while you were mapping out your process, it's, that's when you did your DCB160 work. I think realistically six weeks is, is more than reasonable if you were. We're going to move into new areas and I think we can, now we've got it up in one area, I think we can do it in four weeks or less. It's Technically, it's not difficult. It's just about agreeing some key things as an organization how are we comfortable working with this some key things you need to talk about is which jobs are we and aren't we going to send out uh, how long are we going to leave them out some really basic questions but other than that it, it is quite simple it can be turned on really quickly it's not like a big it project that you need to be thinking this is months and months of work it's not okay that thanks lee I, I'm, I'm going to chip in on that one and just say that technically the solution sits in the cloud. It's on uh, Amazon Web Services, and actually, we can deploy technically deploy the solution very quickly. So the implementation is all about, you know, what barriers are you going to move very very quickly? And I think in the current climate, um, actually, you, you know, it can be done considerably quicker than than what we what we did. Uh, with due respect, Liam, what, what we did with um, uh, in Blackpool. But Taz, do you want do you want to pick up the broader question about 
um, it being introduced in other roles in, in primary care and in its potential? Yeah, sure. And just, just on the implementation, um, obviously we've learned a lot as, as we've been deploying in other areas. So much has changed around the things that were taking a while around onboarding, around the IT solutions. They took weeks. So in terms of us switching it on, it's almost uh, almost immediate we can do that. And obviously DockerBuds on the on the um, app stores now. It's your processes and systems, and that's what I think Liam's referring to. But we've got all the guides and all the training online, so we think we can get this in very, very quickly. The, the different roles, I mean, it's absolutely critical. If you've got a palliative care patient, why, you know, why do you come to me as a GP? Get a palliative care nurse on Docker Bode, um, who is notified just of those skill sets that she's able to, to, to see, he or she's able to see. Um, it's absolutely about bringing on different providers. And what Docker Bode allows is for everyone to utilize our most precious asset, which is our workforce. And, and, and right now, we're in a really difficult place with workforce. So if we can bring on the community nurses um, uh, phlebotomist, anyone who needs to be physically with a patient. DocuBud allows that ability to do that. All the navigation is taken care of, communications are taken care of, um, and all the logistics are managed. So being able to open that primary care workforce up and allow collaboration, it, it's central to the core feature of DocuBud. Um, and, and yeah, absolutely, it's how you know, Liam has already mentioned they did it and they're doing it for the, for the file coast. But they're expanding it across all their other sites in and out of hours, and so are other uh, other customers. Okay, yeah, thanks, Taz. Can I can I bring you in at this point because you've got uh, immense experience right across the system from the very top to being being a GP, and I think some of the the, the questions are pushing on. You know, what's the potential for this to 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 really help with the COVID situation and actually looking across roles, organizations, systems. Can can you can you say something about the future where, where you see this? Oh, have we Who was that too, sorry John? Was that Phil, did you say? Sir Barbara. Oh Sir Barbara. I'm doing what everybody else has done and done the unmuting. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm so sorry about that. Um, I, I just think this has enormous potential. I, I, I really believe it's a godsend now that we've got COVID because nobody should underestimate how much uh, we're going to have real problems with home visits. The point Taz made about all sorts of people who've who will have been uh, not seen as much as they normally are, where we need catch up. And it doesn't have to be doctors. This could be, you know, you could, one could imagine a scenario where this could apply to uh, district nurses, where it could apply in social care, um, all sorts of situations. And you know, the only method we've ever had before really is, you know, bring people in for a set number of hours and and have them drive around or be driven around. Whereas to kind of open up the whole of the workforce, and I've. You know, it's clearly encouraging how many people long before COVID were happy to sign up for this. So there are a lot of people, um, you know, they, they might not want to go sit for six hours, you know, to plan to be out of the way for six hours. But if it's a quiet afternoon or, um, or, or they're not doing anything, or particularly if it's their own patient. Um, so, so I think for the moment, I think it's just really important, and I'm sure Dr. Bode will do this, to concentrate on how can we be the best help we can be in order to help uh, with the uh, with COVID response. Um, but I think then it, it will go on. I think we will see it used across um, most services where a wider workforce is needed, um, particularly when it's going into people's homes. Although, again, there are ways that you might possibly imagine that um, it could it could work for people up picking, you know, one picking up one or two hour um, GP surgeries uh, at, at at relatively short notice, um, or picking up a session of doing GP triaging. So I think I think the opportunities in the UK uh, are enormous, and you know we always are leading in the world in the NHS. And I'm sure once we're using like this, this uh, others will want to follow. Um, but I think at the moment, and I know this to be the case, that Taz and the team are absolutely turning their attention to. What are all the things we can help do um, to help the NHS out at the moment? Okay, thank, thanks, Barbara. Um, there is a there's a question about the recruitment drive uh, for for uh, community nurses and, and and I guess other other professionals. 
Um, Taz, do you want to say something about the positioning of, of Dockerbode in relation to recruitment drives? Yeah, is that the question that's coming online? Someone's gone on our website. Is that where you're reading that from? Yeah, oh, that from Mandy's end. Oh, no, I've got another one, sorry. But, okay, so the recruitment drive, these aren't Dockerbode. Um, you know, the recruitment drive, we help you with that. <laughs> Just like we've seen all these volunteers that have signed up to, to help out the NHS. Um, these are your clinicians. It could be clinicians that work for you, the ones that are just interested in this. We would typically work with the HSNs, the CCGs, reach out to your existing networks and, and just raise the awareness to let them know um, that they're able to work. Um, whether you're a PCN, whether you're um, a GP federation, um, you can use Dockerboat in this way. Uh, and that drive really has to come from within. There's no point in us trying to uh, convince people. It really has to be this is a way you can contribute some of your time without any obligation to be able to see people local to you. And you can filter it based on a number of things like how far away they are amongst many other things. So I think the, the recruitment side of it is working with organizations, with the medical directors, with the teams, um, within community nursing, uh, district nursing, practices, and just letting them know that how easy it is to sign up to this from a clinician point of view, very simple. Obviously, the assurance processes previously were one of the big um, areas of onboarding. Now, we are absolutely provided are absolutely desperate, um, obviously trying to maintain uh, you know, as much as they possibly can the integrity that these commissions are assured, and that is up to the provider. But when they then click the button from their administration portal in Docker Mode, that clinician is effectively live in their system. And so really, the main thing that re recruitment is about word of mouth. And as soon as people start using it, they then talk to others who then realize um, how simple it is uh, and it needs the support of providers and the community as a whole to really get this off the ground in the area and we've got expertise to help support that. Okay, uh, thanks. Um, question on resilience. Uh, can, can you say something about uh, in the current climate, there's no guarantee that what we've got today will be here tomorrow? Um, can you say what confidence uh, people can have in the resilience of Dockerboat being being around and how you've safeguarded that? Sure. I mean, um, I think you mentioned before, we're, uh, we've worked very hard um, to build the technology and infrastructure and architect it in a way that, that is relying on very tried and tested um, international through AWS um, secure platform. Um, everything has been set up. Um, We've got the backing of um, very big national um, developers as well. We have our own in-house development team. And we just have a process that this software can be scaled um, in the right way. It was a requirement when we were awarded the SBRI funding um, to not only scale nationally, but internationally. We've built a, a system to be able to do that, that has that resilience. Um, and obviously we're adapting it. We're listening to our customers. We're listening to, I'm listening to my colleagues. Um, about introducing new features, um, such as a job stacking. You know, going out for one job, you were previously locked out of seeing any other visits. Um, but if you can say, look, I'll see a cluster of visits in my area, great, the, they're able to do that and the provider agrees with that. Um, how the logistics work, how the PPE works, these are real life considerations. I know people like Liam and others and their teams are, able, are, are looking at how, how to resolve this whether this is someone who supports a, a doctor or G, a GP or nurse uh, to take them there or they go on their own. All these are logistical things that we are working with our customers to resolve and we're building some things to help mitigate that in the software as well. Okay, thanks. And uh, Martin, Martin Slingsby's made a, made a point, but I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you, Phil, uh, about this because I know the point that Martin Slingsby's just made is the thing that you that you were very excited about when when we first went through Dockerboard and, and how it would help in the Northwest. Um, and also, Phil, with you being all, uh, a GP too, and also working in out of hours, can you just say, can you just expand on um, the point that Martin's made about, he can see that this is really helping to make roles more attractive with uh, inventive ways to allow flexible working in primary care. Yeah, so I just, it is genuinely um, innovative in as much as that 
GPs haven't had this um, ability to work on such a discretional basis. Um, and so I think there are, there are plenty of people who will work on a no obligation type of basis. Um, and especially when it may be with their own patients and apart from being paid as a, as a motivation, there's clearly benefit to GPs who know those patients well and often the kind of patients who are most prone to an unplanned admission are the ones that can only reasonably be kept at home by those doctors who really know them. Um, and the way that Docabode opens that up is, is a completely new way of working. And certainly all colleagues who I've talked to about it uh, they're all very enthusiastic to be given that opportunity to be able to dip in and out and uh, provide care to their own patients, but without the, the hurdles that a long shift in the out of hours would create. And unfortunately, I think um, what's happened increasingly in out of hours services is that we've seen that kind of core staffing of you know, regular GPs in the area gradually erode over time, whereas potentially Dockerbode re-recruits those kind of daytime GPs back into an out of hours system. Um, and I think that's got to be good news for continuity of care, really good news for patients, and I'm sure it'll have added uh, safety benefits and benefits to ongoing unplanned care as well. So it is, it is a really great opportunity. Okay, uh, thanks, Phil. I think we're uh, we're at the end of uh, the the questions. Uh, Taz, I'll just pass it back over to you, and and if if you could just say something about next steps in terms of if if anyone's interested, um, where they go. Uh, Bob's highlighted, you know, uh, some procurement routes to be able to to get this. Where I know that procurement uh, is is not the priority at the moment, but you still need to know that you've got a robust system that's been properly assured and uh, you will have to go through uh, the, the the appropriate routes. So Taz, if you could if you could just say something about what next for people um, who who are potentially interested in this. Yeah, sure, happy to, to just close on that. Um, I'll put the details on the screen. Um, the best way is just to contact us on our email address, info at Um We'll take that interest, depending on where you are in the country. Um, we will, we've got a great relationship with the HSNs. If we don't know them personally, we would get a handshake from any one of the HSNs we've been working with into your area. Um, and then we would, um, what, and what Phil did brilliantly in, uh, in Northwest, and he, he would introduce us to the regional NHS England teams, um, and then we would take things from there. And look at your requirements, um, and we can do all this remotely as well. So I think just get in touch if you've got a question, if there's something that isn't clear. Um, a lot of this was just at a high level. We can go through demos. We can show you the product remotely as well, um, just to get a feel for it. Um, and I think you know the offer is we will get um, again on a sort of first come first serve. Whoever comes to us and they want this, we'll get it in at whatever it takes um, to a cost price implementation. So we've just got the, the cover of that, really. You can use it for six months, and if you want, you can stop using it. Hopefully, this crisis will have ended by then. Of course, we don't want you to, to stop using it after that, um, but you will have, you could walk away even after six months. And so we will make things as attractive as possible. Just, we just, I just want this to help and support patients at this time, and I want to support my colleagues who, who we want to contribute uh, in a way that's safe and, and, and that's scalable and that works across all these really hard working organizations, the CCGs, the, the primary care networks, and everyone is working very hard to create new models and systems that this could manage in a very effective way. Um, so that's my plea, reach out to me, and I'd be happy to have, have a phone call with you um, or do it via uh, WebEx or Teams. Um, but yeah, please do get in touch. And I think really on that note, unless there's any more questions, I don't, I can't see the questions when this is on my screen, but. Yeah, no, that, that, that's all the questions, Taz. Okay. So I just want to say thank you uh, for everyone. I don't know, John, if you wanted to, to finish off, but yeah, thanks for, for your time uh, and listening to us today. Hopefully we'll, um, we'll, we'll speak to you soon. Over to you, John. 
Thanks, that Taz. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say a quick thanks um, you know, to everyone that's uh, presented today. Um, I think it's been a huge, uh, huge support we've got. Um, I think it kind of shows the um, the faith everyone has in the Docker Boat solution, particularly um, you know, in terms of everyone that's, that's willing to come along and give their time these these sort of busy times to to, to back it. Really, um, so I hope yeah, you found the presentations useful. So we're going to spark some thoughts, thoughts and interest really. Um, as Taz says, yeah, please absolutely get in contact with them directly. Your your kind of local AHSN, uh, we'll ever kind of support those kind of conversations as well. Um, so obviously you know, we've got the, the reach into the the networks that we can kind of open some doors potentially that, um, that might not be there at the moment. Um, so yeah, so I just want to say yeah, thank you for everyone for joining today. Um, hope you hope you found it useful um, and have a reasonably pleasant afternoon. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye now.